On Monday, I shared the top 10 players on my big board to start 2023. And on yesterday, I rounded out my lottery. So overall, I did 14 players. Now in this episode, I'm going to discuss a few players that missed my lottery that have a chance of making it. I'll discuss some players that I like and a few players that I'll just be honest with you. I've been disappointed in. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I am your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And this episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Someone asked me, how do I know that this is their first listen of the day? That's a simple question. Who else would you listen to before you listen to the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast? Simple question. All right, just uh, just just joking there. All right, so let's let's just a recap. If you missed the first two days of this big board analysis that I've been given, number one was Francis Victor Wimbayama. Number two was Scoot Henderson from the G League Ignite. Number three and number four were the Thompson Twins from Overtime Elite. Number five was Gigi Jackson from South Carolina. At number six, I had Keontae George from Baylor. And seven was Nick Smith from Arkansas, who I wonder if we are going to see Nick Smith again this season. And number eight, I had Brandon Miller from Alabama. Number nine, Villanova's Cam Whitmore, who I think is going to be the first Villanova player to to be a one and done since Tim Thomas in 1997. At number 10, I have Kaysen Wallace from Kentucky. At number 11, I have Terquavion Smith, who made me look good tonight because he lit up Duke. At number 12, I had Anthony Black. Number 13, Jairus Walker. And at number 14, I had Maxwell Lewis. Those are my top 14 prospects for the 2023 draft to start the year. I know it's a little bit against the consensus because... I don't go against, I don't go with the consensus and I have this theory, right? And I just tweeted it earlier today. And I mean, I would never do it because I mean, it would obviously hurt the kid in a sense. Maybe you can say it would help the kid, but I feel like it's a lot of follow the leader when it comes to mock drafts. I mean, we all do it to a certain extent, but I wonder, let's say there was this kid that was in high school and he was a guy that was going to be an average Division One player. And I wonder if all of the top platforms, like if it was ESPN, Bleach Report, all of these guys, if, let's say I gave each publication $100,000. Say, hey, I need you to put this guy in your top 10. And, you know, created the highlight reel behind it. And he's on these different mocks. And then created, like I said, the highlight reel. I mean, I've done highlight tapes for people. I can make anybody look good on the highlight tape. I know the tricks. If the guy, I mean, if the kid scored four points in the game, you highlight the, the four points, you put charges on there, you put passes that during the system. I mean, it's, it's easy. That's why a lot of times when people tell me they want me to watch a kid play, I'm like, send me his name. I'll see if I can find him on Synergy or send me a full tape. I don't want to watch highlights because anybody can look good on highlights. So anyway, let's say I did that, right? This kid, again, this guy is an average, he projects to be an average Division One player. But if all the top platforms put this guy as a top 10 pick, and then he has a very mediocre freshman season, and then I change the narrative of, oh, man, he's raw, he just started playing three years ago, yada, 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 I, I think that there's a possibility that that kid could get drafted based off hype alone. So... One of the things I'm doing in 2023 is I'm not, I mean, I never really went with the consensus anyway, but I'm totally going against the consensus. I'm going with my eye test. I know there's a good chance that I'm going to be wrong, but I honestly feel like there are a lot of players that aren't as good as the hype, aren't as good as as the buzz that they had coming into the season. I, I thought it was very obvious for 2020. I think that there were players that, played in states that were open during COVID 
and some guys really made a name for themselves that summer and they climbed up the rankings because they weren't playing California. They weren't playing kids from different states and they, and they just dominated the states that were open and they shot up the rankings. People thought that they were really good. They were projected as one and done players or they were projected as guys that could, you know, enter after their freshman or sophomore year. And now some of those players have not lived up to the hype. And I don't think it's necessarily the player's fault. I think the hype around them made people feel like this player was a one or two year prospect, which in reality they weren't. So I said, I said all that to say this, and I, I posed a question on Twitter. A lot of mocks, and this is not a knock on Dylan Mitchell. A lot of mocks have Dylan Mitchell as a top 10 pick, a lottery pick, right? And my question is, what is the difference between Dylan Mitchell in 2023 and Kendall Brown in 2022? Both are athletic. You can say Dylan Mitchell is a little bit more athletic. I thought Kendall Brown showed more offense, wasn't a great shooter, one of my knocks on Kendall Brown was he was a reluctant shooter, but he is a much more confident shooter than Dylan Mitchell. Dylan Mitchell, as of today, has taken five jump shots total. At least Kendall Brown, who I thought was too reluctant of a shooter, too passive, attempted one three per game. Kendall Brown was a better passer, but he failed to number 48 in the draft. So my question, and you can answer this on on YouTube, what is the difference between Dylan Mitchell and Kendall Brown? And actually, Kendall Brown was playing last year at 18. If I'm not mistaken, they're like four months apart. They were born in 2003, I think. I think Kendall Brown may have been born in May and Dylan Mitchell may have been born in September. So age-wise, it's not much of a difference. Kendall Brown showed more offensive skill set, but he fell to 48. Now, if it's some intel stuff, that's totally different. But I want to know your opinion. What is the difference between the two? So... Again, this episode is just strictly my opinion. I don't care if I'm wrong. I mean, a lot of us are going to be wrong. It's like the weatherman, you know, <laughs> you can be wrong. But anyway, I talk about a few players that did not make my lottery, but I think have a chance to. And I talk about some guys that I'm not as high on as the consensus. And the first player that I think has a chance to crack the lottery is Jet Howard. Now, Jet Howard played at IMG. He was on the team with Keontae George and Jairus Walker definitely didn't have the same fanfare and hype as those two guys and I think there is a chance that maybe he could end up being drafted higher small chance I think Keontae is going to be a lot for as a top 10 pick I mean things could change as we enter conference play but Jet Howard has exceeded expectations I think maybe he was a top 35 player did not see him on any top 60 mock drafts coming into the season and I mean including myself and he is a guy that I think is going to be really good in the NBA the most impressive thing about him is the shot making not necessarily the shot making off the dribble even though he shows flashes of that and I'm a guy that just loves guys that can create their own offense probably to a fault of mine because I'll take a a bucket getter over a three and d guy any day of the week and twice on Sunday but Howard has shown flashes of that, even though, you know, his name is Jet. He doesn't play like a Jet. I guess neither did Jason Terry. Well, maybe he was a little faster early in his career. But what I love about Howard is the ability to shoot, whether it's off the catch, off the dribble and on the move. And I think his skill set as a shooter and his size makes him an intriguing prospect that if he has a strong season in, in the Big Ten, I definitely think that he could end up being a name that ends up in the back end of the lottery. Another player that I want to talk about that did not make my lottery that I am pretty high on is Baba Miller. All right. So he hasn't played a game yet. He got suspended for some, some nonsense. He'll make his debut on January 11th. I mean, it just, it just sucks for him, but he is, A guy that I think if he has a strong, if he just shows flashes, I mean, he's going to be super rusty. I mean, he hasn't played competitive basketball in in months, so he's going to be rusty. But he's 6'11". He's a guy that was a guard, and he had a crazy growth spurt. And from everything that I've heard, he's been shooting the ball well in practice. Again, practice is totally different than games, and Florida State is 
not a good team. So he might be looking really good in practice because, again, they're not a really good team. But he is someone that I'm intrigued with with his skill set because he's 6'11". He's a little thin. He's athletic. He has guard skills, wing skills, and he can shoot the ball. My biggest concern about Baba Miller coming into this season was he played overseas. He played for Real Madrid, and he was like an outlier athletically in Europe. And I want to see how he fares when he does not have such a, a huge athletic advantage on the floor. But I'm high on Baba Miller. And right now, I have him at number 16. So I'm going out on a limb here, but I'm just going by the eye test. And I, and I think that he has a chance to be one of the, the better freshmen in this class. All right. When we return, I'll talk about a few other prospects that I'm high on. But I have to talk to you about the number one source for sporting for sports betting info stats news and analysis and that is betonline.net you can get the latest odds and trends for every professional amateur league out there from pro football to college bowl season which is wrapping up and basketball they even had the world cup they have it all on betonline.net and if you love sports podcasts outside of the locked on network you can find those at betonline as well BetOnline is the fastest and the easiest way to get your sports betting info, so you can head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline is where the game starts. Once again, you are listening to the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, and this is your host, Rafael Barlow. All right, I'm just going to talk about a few guys that I am probably a little bit higher on than the consensus. Deron Holmes. I'm a big fan of Deron Holmes. I think he's still a little raw, but he's very productive. He is a guy that coming into this season, I thought he was going to be a first round pick and quietly, quietly, he's still a first round pick, at least for me he is. What I like about him is that he is skilled, he's agile, he's a good athlete, he is a guy that can serve as your your vertical lob threat. I think he has upside as a face-up scorer, somebody that can score and, and transition, I think that he has good upside because he shows some flashes of of, of touch. And um, the thing about him that I feel like has helped him out this year is he's shown some, some glimpses of being a pretty good passer. Again, he's still raw, but he's made some passes and some reads that I thought that were pretty impressive. Um, he has some ball handling skills. I love his motor, the fact that he plays with energy. He cuts rebounds, draws fouls with his activity. I think that, and and this is just the first comparison that comes to mind. I mean, I I look at how Nick Claxton is succeeding with the Nets, and I think Holmes can have a Nick Claxton-type impact also. But I think he might have a little bit more potential as a shooter and passer. But even if, you know, he doesn't, and they just put him in a box as a Roman, I think he can have a Nick Claxton Tight roll. The, the concerns are the shooting consistency and the touch. Again, he's a little bit raw. I thought that he was too right hand dominant. I thought that he needed to work on his his left hand. Another thing that I, I wanted to see him improve on was I thought he loaded up. And when I say load up, I mean it's like if you know you give a, a big the ball and he's he's squatting down to power up as as opposed to keeping it high. I call it like the the Powell Gasol. I thought Gasol was the best at that. But overall, I like Deron Holmes. And I have him as a first-round pick. I haven't seen many boards with him as a first-round pick. But me, I got him as a first-round pick. Another guy that I'm high on who has a similar role, um, you're you're starting to see him get a little bit of buzz right now, is Alabama's Noah Clowney. I think that he is someone that has a chance to be a first-round pick also. Not a name coming into the season that was... You know, a projected first round pick. I mean, you saw Khalil Ware and Derek. I'm sorry, Khalil Ware and Derek Lively as the top bigs in the draft after Victor Wimbayama. But I think Clowney has a chance to get drafted ahead of both. He's shown flash, flashes as a passer, also very similar. Runs the floor. He's agile. He's fluid. Think there is some promise as a shooter. He does. He's not afraid to let it fly from, from deep. Um, not shooting it at a high clip, but. I just off the top of my head, I think his percentages are around the same as Wimbayama. Totally different level of shot making and shots. But, you know, if you believe in Wimbayama is going to be an average three-point shooter, and you have to say that, you may say that Clowney has a chance to do the same thing. 
as as a spot up catch up shooter, um, spot up catch and shoot floor spacer. Um, Clowney's active around the rim. He shows some flashes of being able to handle the ball and attack closeouts. He rebounds, good hands. He's not crazy vertically explosive. Doesn't have like that amazing pop, but he is a, a pretty good athlete. The concern is the shooting potential is there, but the free throw percentage, the indicators, as it just depends. If you believe that free throw shooting is the best indicator of shooting touch, then you may not be as high on his upside as I am. But overall, I like Noah Clowney. I have him as a first round pick on my board. Another guy that I have as a first rounder is Jalen Clark. He's starting to get a little bit of buzz. He's doing a little bit of everything for UCLA. I talked about him briefly in a episode last week. Huge improvements from the year before, shooting the ball at a a good rate. I think the last time I looked, he's at 38% from three. He's shown flash as a passer, rebounder, hustle guy. I think that he is a first-round pick. I think that he is – He's your typical guy that has gotten better every year in college, and then as a junior, he made the big jump. We're so focused on the freshmen that are coming in and one and done. And some of these freshmen that are getting drafted are getting drafted specifically on potential and not production at all. I mean, I don't want to go through the names, but there's some guys that just did not have good numbers, and they were drafted on their long-term potential. And I'm big on – Production. I mean, there are some cases where I can say, like, this guy wasn't crazy productive, but I thought he showed enough flashes. And he's on a team where he's not getting the opportunity because he's a freshman on a a team that is loaded with veterans. But Jalen Clark is a guy that has been productive on a a good team and first round pick, in my opinion. Right. I want to talk about Derek Lively. And I've talked about him briefly before. I think Lively made a mistake by going to Duke and. In 2023, I'm just not going to be afraid to express my opinion. It may bite me in the butt in in some cases. But I think that if Lively went to, you know what, I'm going to just throw a crazy situation out there. I like Yuri Collins from St. Louis, one of the nation's leaders in assists. He might be leading the nation in assists, averaging like 10 assists per game. And I'm wondering, and and I get it, you know, Duke, St. Louis, you're going to choose Duke all the time. But I wonder, like, with some of the – Top rated bigs in the country, right? When you pick your school, are you picking it because you had a great visit, you had a fun time, the coach sold you, but are you really paying attention to who is going to get you the ball? And I think if Lively went to a team that had a point guard that was going to get him the ball and get him touches, I think he would look a lot better. I have not sold all of my lively stock yet. There are some concerns there. I think that the motor is kind of iffy, not the most physical presence. But he showed flashes as a shooter in high school. He hasn't been able to showcase them at all. And I still think he is probably going to be your first-round pick, not because of production, but because of his high school hype, which is something that I've mentioned before that I'm you know, totally against. But... I, I do think that if he were in a different situation, I think that he could shine. But we'll see. I mean, we'll we'll see if he decides to to um, enter the draft. Which I mean, to me, it doesn't make sense for him to go back to Duke because what could <laughs> what could possibly change unless Filipowski's gone and I think Ryan Young should be gone and maybe they'll. But you know, in, in today's era, most guys aren't coming back to school, especially if they think that there's a chance that they will be a first round pick without having to be productive so I wouldn't say I'm higher on him than the consensus I think right now you know he's fallen on most draft boards but I haven't sold my stock but there is a guy that is playing in Europe that I am high on it is James Najee I've spoke about him briefly I think that he is a little underrated I see ESPN still has him as a first round pick so props to them I think that I would I would take him in the first round. I think he just has a specific skill set and a specific role that fits the NBA. He's physical presence. He's going to be your rim runner, your vertical lob threat, your rebounder, your your shot blocker. I just think he has a role that that you can plug and play. I don't think that there's a lot of upside. I don't think that there's promise as a shooter, but 
I think that with the physical tools and rebounding athleticism, I think that he has a a, a shot to you know be like a ten year player. I don't know if he's going to be a, a starter, but I, I can see him as a top seven or eight rotation player. Or another guy that missed my lottery that I think has a specific skill set and a role is Grady Dick, and his role is to be a shooter. He has good positional size. He can knock down shots. I think there is a chance that he could sneak into the lottery if he continues to shoot 48% from three in conference play. The Big 12 is the toughest conference in the league, in my opinion. So I think if he's knocking down shots at a high clip, and Kansas continues to win, and he's showing he can do a little bit more than shoot. I mean, he has some plays where he's making reverse layups around the rim, and if he can show that defensively that he's not, you know, a, a negative, I think that he can sneak into the lottery conversation. Another guy that I'm high on, high on who is starting to get a little bit of buzz now, and I talked about him weeks ago, is Taylor Hendricks. Didn't have the greatest game against Houston. I think he missed like his first five shots but I thought he still showed he showed what he's capable of he showed that he is someone that um you gotta look out for that that could be a a late first round pick so I'm pretty high on on Taylor Hendricks Kyle Filipowski is someone that I'm I'm going back and forth on I like the skill set I like what he brings to the table he's been Duke's best best freshman in my opinion um I definitely think he's an NBA player I don't know where I would I mean I have him in my top 30 and I'm wrestling it where where exactly is he inside the top 20 is he outside 25 I'm not sure but I will have to I'm gonna have to sleep on a little bit more and Especially after watching today's game against against NC State, I was not impressed with any of the Duke freshmen at all in, in that game, and I don't know what's going on there. I don't know if they're just. I mean, I know they're not living up to the hype. I mean, that's clear. But I don't know if they were. I don't. I don't know if it was the injuries. I don't know if it's a situation where they didn't have a lot of time to to gel in the preseason. They've just been disappointing, and I mean, that's just being totally, totally honest. They have not lived up to the hype. You know, just looking at the numbers today, uh, Filipowski was 4 of 10. He had 14 points, 8 rebounds. Okay game. Um, Lively, only one shot, 3 rebounds. Don't know what's going there. Whitehead had some moments there. He was 4 of 7 from 3, 4 of 8 from the floor overall. He had 12 points, but it seems like most of those points came when they were getting smacked around. And, you know, Duke, coming into the season, we thought Duke was going to have three guys in the first round. Some even had four. Some people thought Tyrese Proctor was a first-round pick. And, I mean, they still could end up with three guys in the first round, but they've been disappointing. They've been disappointing. Well, that wraps up this episode. It's a short episode. Tomorrow, I will have someone from the Locked On NBA Big Board crew. Haven't heard much from them in the last few days. I've been kind of hogging up the, the space. And, you know, guys were on breaks and they took vacations over Christmas, which is totally right. And then they totally deserve it. But we will be back at full strength. Well, that wraps up this episode. Thank you again for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, check out the Game to Game podcast, Game to Game NBA. It's every moment, every top performance. Every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. So follow Game to Game on the Locked On NBA channel, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. Once again, this is Raphael, the director of for NBA Big Board, and I am out.